So today's topic will be about IMU-based trajectory image classification for human activity recognition. What it means, I will show you in a couple of seconds, and a couple of minutes, but for, just for you as a, an information, so if you have any questions, I don't mind if you um, unmute yourself and raise the question in between. Um, so if you have something in mind which is very urgent or something like this and you want to know it immediately, just holler, just interrupt me. I'm, I'm totally okay with it. And for today's presentation, um, it's a paper that we published a few months back. But um, what I also want to tell you, I will give you a broad overview. So I don't want to talk about what we um, had on results, on the results side, what we were um, doing. I will give you a broad overview so that you can uh, grasp what we like in a broader context, what we were trying to do. So I will give you a little bit of background so that you can understand me more, so that you can put yourself into my shoes. So how this uh, eventually happened. So, okay. So today's agenda, I will give you a, a short overview. I will start with an, an introduction. So it, I will talk a bit about what was my uh, initial motivation how did I end up with like doing activity recognition in this particular case, nerfing acti activity recognition, and what did lead to what I will show you today. And then we will continue with the methods for this particular case, the results on this side, the discussion, and at the end, I will also give you a conclusion and future work that can be done based on the results we had. So, okay, let's start with the introduction. I know I have random images here, but let me tell you something about it. So um, when I started at the Digital Health Center, and I will just tell you, I mean, just my personal opinion on this, digital health is a really, really cool topic. I mean, there's a lot of potential and there is much to gain for everyone. And I think it's a real cool, it's a real hot topic. And that was also my first, um, intuition why to go to this um, part of digital health. And the thing is, um, it was, I think it was two years ago um, when I tried to find my topic. Um, and um, I saw a lot of my colleagues with different backgrounds. We had physicians, we had uh, people from psychology, we had computer science, we had mathematicians, we had a lot of people and it's a really cool group because they are really diverse and we can participate from, from each other. And what I saw that uh, a lot of people that, uh, which is very common for digital health, they started to do um, research on um, EHR, so electronic health record, which was very common for most of the people they did um, image classification. So basically, so the part of uh, medicine, which we call radiology, um, they try to combine genetics and images. They did, um, they did deal with a lot of sensors and try to uh, figure out things. And for me, it was like, okay, these are very common topics, but I wanna do something different, which is not very common. So, and I ended up with, okay, who are the people who do a lot of work, um, but where we can help, but the focus is not so much on the medicine side, but they can benefit from digital health in general. So I ended up with uh, thinking of nurses. And I have to give a lot of credit to nurses because they're doing a great job and they're not paid very well and I can tell you because um, almost a week ago, a bit more, I, I will tell you in a second, um, I was in the hospital. And to be honest, I deal more with the nurses than with the doctors. I think it's in most cases. And if you are in an elderly care facility, especially in Europe, if you think about it, so because of the demographic changes, um, we will need much more of these kind of people, nurses who care about others. And the question was, okay, how can we help these people? So what I did was, okay, I said to myself, okay, just go stay a week with nurses and try to figure out how digital health can help nurses. 
that was my initial motivation. So as you can see in this image here, um, I mean, we have random images, but what you can see is like they gather around, they talk about patients, they try to share information. And what they do is they go to the patient, they do certain things. And after that, they document everything which they have done. Like, I don't know, like that's, uh, I was cleaning the patient, I was like uh, changing the bandage or, I was like uh, giving infusion and these kind of things. A lot of things with the, which they put into paper. I mean, this is crucial. I know they have to do it. And it has not only sense in the means of um, for insurance companies, it's also a way of communicating between each other and with the doctor. And you can even maybe see over time how patients change and um, how, I mean, uh, this status of the patient changes. So that was my initial motivation, how I ended up with um, caring about nurses, let's say. So then, so if, you try, if, if we try to think about it, so um, I ended up with exactly, that was my point. So when I watched them, what I figured out is, okay, digital health can help nurses in terms of the documentation, because if you take a look at the documentation, this time spent on documentation, it takes up to 30% of their work. It depends on the source, but sometimes they're talking about 10%, some are talking about 30%. So it's between 10 and 30, I'd say. So from my personal experience, like this one week journey, I'd say it was like one hour per day on an eight hours shift. But it's a lot, it's a lot. And for sure, uh, like um, software solutions or let's say digital health solutions can help a lot. And if you take a look at the research that is going on in that field, you, you, will, not, uh, you will notice that it's more about like uh, simplification of the software. So a better haptic or to get things easier and um, having more and more apps, which are like, which can help the nurses. On the other hand, like another focus of the research is like people are trying to go in more and more into the direction of machine learning. In this particular case, it's more about speech to text, which is very obvious in that case. But I wanted to do something different because if you take a look, if you, if you, if you walk with them, you will realize that a lot of the activities that nurses are doing are physical activities. So it was obvious to me, or I was like, okay, that's interesting, but there's this one field called human activity recognition. Can human activity recognition somehow help to um, track the activities that nurses are doing and to classify them so that the documentation will, gen will be generated automatically so that it, they don't have to spend time on the documentation itself. That was my initial idea. So, um, like I said in the beginning, I wanna make it like a bit like a lecture so that you can follow uh, what I'm talking about. So let me define what is human activity recognition. So human activity recognition in general is the problem of predicting the movement of a person. Let's take a look here. So we have a human gesture, which could be anything. I will uh, come to this in the next slide. Then based on this gesture, you try to, uh, you have a sensor which uh, uh, like um, takes note of this gesture and, on, and then it will be this kind of data which will be produced through the sensor will go to an algorithm, let's say, and at the end, you will get something like, okay, this was gesture A, B, or C, uh, depending on the predefined uh, gestures that you are looking for. So let's take a look at some of these gestures. So it could be anything. It could be walking, it could be running, it could be sitting, it could be laying, it could be standing, walking upstairs, it could be cycling or whatever. I mean, you can do whatever you want, like on the side of physical activities. So, and this will be feed into a sensor. And when we, when we talk about sensor, it could also be anything. Just take a look at your smartphone over here. You will see that there are a lot of sensors in your smartphone. 
So it could be accelerometers, could be gyroscope, it could be the camera, it could even be like PPG data, it could be anything, depending on the gesture you are like interested in. And now that you have your gesture, that you have your sensor, there are also a lot of, a lot of different algorithms that you can go for. So we have classical machine learning algorithms uh, with feature extraction and the model itself. And it could be something on the side of deep learning. I'm not so sure, maybe uh, Christian can say a word maybe later on. Um, maybe, uh, I think he will maybe give a speech about this in, in the upcoming uh, seminars. But uh, I don't wanna go too much into this, but in general, just keep in mind that there are different models that you can use and try to figure out what the person had done. So, and at the end, you will get something like a probability. And this uh, probability, probability will, base, uh, will be based on your um, gestures that you are trying to figure out. But uh, maybe a small anecdote at this point, um, it doesn't work always because sometimes like your movements are not the typical kind of movements. And that happened to me, to be honest, one and a half years ago. So it doesn't always work. So I played football and you have to know I'm a small guy and there was this one, this guy, 195 tall and he was standing in front of me and I was scared and with my bad football technique, I stumbled over the ball and I broke my leg. That was one and a half years ago. And uh, recently, uh, I think it's now eight, nine days. I don't know, I'm not so sure about. Um, as you can see, like um, I look like Robocop or something like this, um, but the doctors told me that um, it's fine. I can still go through the security without peeping, you know, but, uh, but I got rid of this material. So uh, I think it was eight, nine days ago, I got surgery. So I got rid of this material. So um, yeah, so much to that. Um, so let's do a small recap on this side. So we have the human gest gesture that could be anything. Then you have the sensor, uh, which keeps track of this. You generate some uh, data out of the sensors. You put it into an algorithm. And at the end, you get some kind of like a probability thing where you can say, OK, it's probable that it's walking or running or whatever. That's what you will also see like in most of your smartwatches nowadays, if you have a smartwatch, you will realize that it tells you, oh, okay, you're just running, you're just walking, and so on and so on. And um, on the other hand, as you can see, you can try to combine these kind of things. And you will see that this world of like human activity recognition is a huge field. And it's not a new field. It's around, I don't know, for maybe 20 years now. So, um, so that we have understood that in most cases nowadays, when we talk about human activity recognition, and if you look, take a look into the literature, you will see that the sensors that are in use are mostly IMUs. And IMUs, or initial measurement units, it's a device that can measure and report specific gravity and uh, angular rate of an object to which it is attached. You will also have this in your smartphone or smartwatch or whatever. So, but when it comes to human activity recognition, the two more, most common ones that are in use are accelerometers um, that provide a measure of specific forces or accelerations and gyroscopes uh, that provide a measure of the angular rate. So magnetometers are not that common use in human activity recognition. And what we will get out of this sensor is, some, is a time series, which you can see here on the top right. And don't get me wrong, it's just a simplified version because uh, normally you have this in X, Y, and Z direction for the different um, sensors. But it's just a simplified version. And what you try to figure out is, okay, this part of, this, uh, of the time series is, uh, of the time period is static. And the next part is running. The next part is uh, walking and so on and so on. And this is when we talk about human activity recognition, that is common research. That is what people focus on mostly, not always, but mostly. And uh, that is, uh, and hopefully now you have an idea of human activity recognition. And when we go back, 
I told you in the beginning that I want to use this for nurses. And I have to admit that I'm not the first one thinking of, about this. I was very sad in the beginning when I realized that uh, someone came up with this idea already. It's a group uh, which is in Japan, um, uh, Sozo Inoue and uh, his team. And uh, they collect data and they try to do nursing activity with more uh, statistical models, I'd say. They even have some challenges uh, with, where people can participate. And, but the major, major goal was not to reduce the documentation time or to make research on this. It was just to collect data and see if you can classify it or not. So that's the background. So now, uh, as I told you in the beginning, um, what I realized is that most people, when it comes to, let's say, machine learning or deep learning, uh, most people, even in human activity recognition, are using so-called CNNs or convolutional neural networks. And they use it in most cases for images because they're really handy when it comes to images. So I had the idea, okay, what if, what if, so just to give you an idea, most research is going on on the image side and less on the activity recognition with variable size. So what if we are capable of using an image classification techniques for human activity recognition with variables? How can we try to combine this? Because on the image side, there is a lot of research uh, which we can make use of. Let me name you two of them, transfer learning and data augmentation. So if you are not familiar with the um, topics, let me just brief tell you. So transfer learning is when you, let's say, let's say you want to classify um, cats and you just have images of dogs. You could train a model on the dog side and try to apply it to the cat's images because the network itself will already learn some features like nose, ears, and so on and so on. And you can try to apply it uh, to your CAD images. And that's the, uh, the, let's say, the idea behind transfer learning. And on the other hand, which is also really, uh, really handy, is that you can use um, data augmentation techniques like flipping and rotating images. And so you try to augment your data set just by flipping and rotating and so on, which is not that easy when it comes to time series data. And that was the initial idea here. So uh, if you take a look at this, this is basically, that was the initial idea. So on the, other, on the one hand, on the left side, we have our classical approach where we have uh, IMU data, so time series data that we try to classify. And on the right side, as you can see, there are also people who try to do um, human activity recognition to classify like uh, gestures, let's say, into uh, different um, activities by using the images. And the idea is like now to take the time series data on the left side and try to make it, uh, to convert it into an image to transform it and then do the classification task. Because uh, like I said, there's more research and, um, and more techniques that you can uh, benefit from. So, okay. And for this uh, reason, um, we found a data set, which is really cool uh, from guys also in Germany from the Max Planck Institute. What they did, they collected data with six IMU sensors um, located as you can see in the image, like on the wrists, on the knees, uh, one on the head, and one on the pelvis, I think. Recorded with 60 hertz. They had a total of 90 minutes recording, uh, 13 different activities with 10 different subjects. So, and the idea is to get full body postures out of the six IMU sensors. That was the initial idea of the Max Planck uh, guys. So, like I said, you have just you have just your IMUs, your six IMUs, and you are getting this 
kind of data, like time series data. And the idea is to put it into a uh, full body posture. So, and when it comes to um, human activity recognition, what you will also always see is that you don't take the whole time series data. So you try to put it into smaller chunks called windows, and that you try to classify the smaller windows. That's, and that's exactly what we have done. So we took, we took the time series data, put it into different windows, overlapping windows, and then we try to generate, just to give you an idea, I will go into this in more detail. What we try to do for each of these windows, we try to get a 3D image, a 3D trajectory image. So we try to follow the trajectory of the movement. And after that, we used a dimensional, uh, dimensionality reduction uh, technique. Like in this case, we use just simple PCA to get a 2D image. And then we realized, okay, the accuracy, accuracy wasn't that good. So let's try something different. Can we just get like heat map images for pixels that are crossed more often? So then we ended up with heat map images. And based on that heat map images, we used our data augmentation uh, techniques, uh, which comes in pretty handy when you use like Python, you can just simply say, okay, I wanna have more like uh, images with flipping and rotating and so on. So we augmented our data set uh, with this kind of technique. And at the end, for classification purposes, we used a convolutional LSTM model, the conf LSTM model. And based on that, we got our predictions for which activity, uh, which is the most or the highest likelihood of being the activity that we are looking for. And um, just to give you like uh, for the evaluation, just to tell you, we also used, um, uh, I just forgot the name, it was a one leaf. We left one out. So what was the right term for it? Leave one person out, exactly, leave one person out for the evaluation. So that is the main idea. So now you're maybe you're asking yourself, okay, how do you get from the time series data, how do you get, uh, get ending with the 3D trajectory? And that's the idea with a, which the Max Planck Institute guys had. It's an idea, they used this six sensors, IMU sensors, they put it in a bi-directional LSTM model. And based on that, they were able to produce a so-called SMPL model. And with this SMPL model, you can get a full body pose, a full body pose just based on six IMU sensors, which is incredible. And, then with having this SMPL model, it's an easy step just to follow or just to track a point that you're interested in and to generate this trajectory. And that's what we did. So we took this SMPL model and we just tracked like a point, a random point that we had an arbitrary point that we were interested in and we generated uh, these um, trajectories. So, and that's what we got, just as an example for, let's say, cross-stepping, just to give you an example, um, we were able to generate images, like heat map images for the trajectory, as you can see, uh, for the example of cross-stepping, you can see that your left and right arm, and that you can say, see that you have this, um, let's say, uh, round uh, pattern, and then you can see like the knees and the head, which is not moving that much. And now we have six images in each timestamp. And based on that images, we can now proceed and use like te techniques from image classification, uh, from the uh, field of image classification. And that's what we did. So we took them, we put them on top of each other, the six images in each timestamp. We used our CNN models uh, for the feature extraction part. And because we are talking about uh, let's say a movie, if you want to call it so. Uh, we also used an LSTM, so that's the reason why we ended up with Conf LSTM to also care about the time in there. 
and we compared them to the original data, which was just time series data. And the results, you can see the results on the next slide. Exactly, you can see it here. So we compared six different models. We compared more, but this is uh, the six uh, that we ended up with like comparing, which were the best ones. So on the one hand, we had the original sensor data that we used and that we where we tried to classify it was uh, conf LSTM models to make it fair. Then we used uh, normal LSTM models with a raw sensor, sensor signal. We took the SMPL model with conf LSTM and LSTM. We took the images that we generated with conf LSTM and the augmented images with conf LSTM. And as you can see in this image, up to five subjects, we, because we had 10 subjects, I have to five subjects, our approach was better. But after five images, the raw sensor signal became better. So um, that's the results that we had. And the data augmentation um, that we had, um, as you can see, it didn't get much better. It was like 1%. But what we ended up with is that our confidence inter interval got much better. This is our, our results. So, And if you also take a look, at the confusion matrix for the different uh, activities, because in the beginning I said we had certain different activities, as you can see, so like some of the activities are uh, recognized much better and some much less. As you can see here, let me just take a look. So it's two and four that I marked here. So like arm head crossings and arm stretches up. Uh, which were sometimes uh, confused with like leg raises, for example, because the movements, if you take a look at the images, are very similar. Or over here, if we take a look at 10 and 11, like squats and sumo squats, they were uh, confused with, let's say, um, what is it? Let me just see, with walking on the one hand and with seven, also with leg raises. But if you take a look at how squats look like, will say, OK, it's really hard for an image to get confused with that, you know? Exactly. So these were our uh, results. So, so let's try to uh, summarize it a bit. So as you can see, like trajectory image uh, conf LSTM outperforms raw uh, sensor conf LSTM for small data sets, as I said, and as you saw in the image but plateaus for larger ones. So, and data augmentation helped us to stabilize the activity pre pre uh, predictions. Um, and failure cases of both conf LFTM models are similar, except for physical body model limitations. So, um, now let's come to the limitations and we have to be honest with our um, results. So, um, to be honest, um, if you want to do this, I mean, as of now, I mean, you need six IMU sensors. So it means you have a complex sensor setup, which can be convenient, but maybe not. It depends on the sensor you have. So, and if you have, let's say, the images on the one hand or the video sequence and the IMU sensor signals on the other hand, uh, as of now, you need an extensive transfer learning for different sensor setups to um, match them with each other. And in our uh, case, we just manually took some vertices. Um, so it's not always uh, trivial. Um, it's also a fixed model position and coordinate system. And we also have difference in speed uh, is that it's not preserved well. Because um, as you saw, like these images are more static and not that dynamic. I mean, we have the frequency in it, but not the speed itself. So I hope. Oh, OK, let's go to the last slide, the conclusion and the outlook. So what could be done in future works, which would be nice, is to look, and I'm pretty sure that would help a lot, is to go for pre tamed models. Uh, I told you in the beginning that um, you can use transfer learning, which would be really nice in that case. Maybe, maybe, which is very similar to this, could be like the MNIST data set which looks very much alike, I would say. So it would be worth to look into this 
if this could help uh, to get better accuracy rates. We could also take a look at 3D convolutions. I'm not so hopeful about this one, to be honest. Um, I think it will take much more time, but I don't know if the perks of this will be um, that much because most of the movements, I think, are more planar, let's say, and not in the... Uh, 3D dimensions, I'm not so sure, So, but it's worth to look at it. And the last uh, one would be um, to use something like an assemble approach where you use both the images and the um, IMU signals and hope to get better results. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I don't know, like the last week I was laying a lot. So um, I was watching a lot of YouTube videos when you're laying around. So. Uh, I, I, I want to say, like, give this video a thumbs up, but I will say, so give the seminar a thumbs up if you want. Um, ring the bell or whatever, or subscribe to the channel or to the seminar. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you a lot. And now um, uh, let's go over to your questions if you have any. Thank you, Horan. So the floor is open for questions. Uh... Okay. Stefan, I think you have one. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, apologies again. I've uh, I had some previous engagements and uh, I came onto this stream a bit late. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, because I saw a short clip of uh, one of the examples of the of the squat movement, and I was wondering if um, most of the most of the movements of the exercises look like this, like a white outline and a black background. Um, no, no, uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so no, at the end, what you will end up with is something like this, right? So um, based on your movement, so that's not an original um, sequence of what we did. That's not, a, it's just an example to give you like um, an idea of uh, what the movements look like. But if you take a look at this movement, you will see that the knees, they're just bending. So you will end up with something like this. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, like your wrist is also not moving, you know? It's just like, just up and down. So what you will get is maybe like something which looks like a line from the from top to bottom. No, and I understand. Uh, the same. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, I was wondering the, the, the reference, the data set you used for, for training um, in reference to the to the background because I don't know what kind of videos or GIFs you, you use for the training, but uh, my thinking is that because you said the squat, uh, the model co confuses the squat with the walking exercise. Exactly. Uh, if it's there were confusing. some reference points in the background so that uh, the the movement can it. be yeah i get it yeah but the thing is they use a really really good camera system it's a vicom system um and i think um i'm not so sure but i guess that the vicom system is really good to give you like really because of the markers and so on a re really good images but i'm not so sure about it to be honest so um, it could be, but I doubt it. I think um, that there isn't any background noise, so to say, if this was your question. Uh, sort of, yes, I think I understood what you're saying. Uh, my, my point was more that uh, in the video itself, because the camera is following the subject and it's sort of, the, the subject is sort of stationary on the X, axis in this so yeah if if there aren't any good like reference points in the background to be seen that he's making progress on the x-axis maybe that's sort of the it could be contributing factor to the issue that it I get uses it. Yeah. I, I get it but uh, like i said i'm not so sure about it um i doubt it but it could be it could be yeah okay thanks yeah, sure. So more questions? Uh, 
Uh, so I don't have a question exactly, uh, but uh, when you started talking about uh, what you did, so uh, combining uh, video classification and uh, inertial sensors, I, I thought that you will you will actually try to classify videos and then transfer that to uh, inertial sensor data or something like that. But you didn't do that, right? I didn't do that, but there is work. There is work where people exactly did what you just said. Um, yeah, I so you... I was wondering, if you could apply this approach of, of yours uh, to, to videos as well, and, and then actually do what I first thought you're doing. I get it. I mean, could it's you nice generate, generate similar data as you're generating from inertial sensors uh, from, from videos, maybe with the help of some post reconstruction like open posts? I get it, but I think it's really hard. It's really hard. I, uh, but I know that there is work uh, done by even like people, um, I think um, Bert knows, like Paul Luchkovich and so on. I think they were working on let there, may, let there be IMUs or let there be IMU or something like this. The, I think the paper is called something like this, where people exactly try to do that. But in that case, um, I just wanted to try something different. So, um, so my approach was total different. I just wanted to see, okay, what if we would have, let's say, in a let's say ideal world, uh, an IMU sensor where you could generate images from? Could these images be classified more accurate, more better, or let's say in combination with the IMUs than just the IMU data itself? So you have, was my, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you have uh, some intuition why uh, your approach worked better for few people, but not so well as the more traditional one based directly on service or data when the number of people was larger? I mean, I'm not a clear, but I can try. I can try. So I think, but I'm not so sure. Um, I think that... Um, for larger data sets, it's normal because you have like the whole information, right? And if you have the whole information and you, if you try to like, uh, if you train a lot, uh, eventually I think you will get better results. But for larger data sets, um, the DIP IMU and this approach of like uh, transferring the IMU data to images, um, they have a better feature extraction in the first place, I guess. That's my just my guessing. So that on a later stage, when you have more and more data, um, that you are more capable capable of generalizing better, let's say. But that's like, like I said, just like I mean, I can also do some research on this, but that's my initial guessing. So the feature extraction in the first place with this approach is better. But um, like on a later stage, um, that the initial data set, which is like more, becomes better and better. Hmm. Yeah, I, I guess that makes sense. I, I imagine that if you uh, added uh, classical machine learning as an additional approach, you it it would work better with fewer pe people as well. I get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be, it could be, to be honest, because I saw also, like I told you, like in the beginning, like um, this um, nursing activity challenge, and I saw that people who won this um, challenge were people who were just using simple machine learning approaches instead of like deep learning models. So you might be right, I guess. Or an, I, I have a question as well. Sure, too. Yeah. So, so your results, the results that you achieved are by using the six IMUs. So and it's so 
you, you consider the entire pose. Uh, when we look at how inertial sensing is being used for human activity recognition, there are a lot of attempts trying to do that with two sensors or even just a single sensor. Obviously, the range of activities uh, is still limited. And so my, my question here is, if you try to look at the results by reducing the number of images, so the number of IMUs that you had available. That's true, and that's exactly what we also did, but it's not a fair comparison. I mean, try to follow me because it's, um, I mean, the thing is, um, we also used like one IMU and compared the image that we generated out of this one IMU to the IMU we had. And we ended up with better classification for the image part. Okay. But then, and we were like happy about it and so on and so on. And I think it was even Bert, like who said, but guys, the images that you generated were based on the six IMUs. So it's not a fair comparison because the images that you generate or, or in order to generate the images, you need all six IMUs. So it's not fair to compare like the six IMUs that you generate the images out of six IMUs with this one IMU. I mean, it's hard to follow, I know. But... No, no, I, I understand. I just thought that each IMU was generating one image, each image. But no, it, I understand that the image, it's, a, it's, it's really a post trajectory. So it's a. Exactly. Uh, okay. So yeah, now, yeah. Then it's I mean, in order to generate this, you need the information of the others. I mean, even if you have this one simple uh, image, you need the others in order to generate it. So you need six IMUs to get this full body pose in order to have like uh, the images that you generate. Okay, because it counts on the rest of the movement to be able to be sure that it's a movement from the, that end alone. Exactly. So that's okay. not a yeah. fair. I, I mean, we did it. I understand. And then we re realized that it's not fair. Okay. So yeah. So the the I understand the complexity of the idea, but now reducing it to a simple to a single IMU, you could also generate. Uh, images and images well it would not be uh, a, pr a prediction of trajectory or it would be a, a one that is less accurate but you could still apply this approach right i don't know if there's work already doing that but probably it, it, yeah you're right but it's not possible so that's what i can tell you because like the um, data you, that you will get out of an imu in order to generate a trajectory you will end up with an image that is done by Picasso or something like this. Because yeah, the thing true. is, because yeah, yeah, because you have like drift, you have error that accumulates over time and you won't, you won't be able to um, do a trajectory image. Mm -hmm. What you can do, what you can do, that's the reason why we use this uh, dip IMU data set where we already had it, where we could use it because we had both. But um, I mean, what people sometimes do, they take the IMU data and they put it into, let's say, a Fourier transformation or something like this, and they end up with an image, which is not a trajectory. It's still an image, but it's like not that, yeah, let's yeah. say, interpretable or, you know, mm -hmm. intuitive, let's say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions for Horan? Horan, I, I, I'll do just one extra. Yeah, sure. uh, so Please. you are continuing with this project or you will apply it in the real world or you are still trying to add more layers to improve your image classification? That's a, that's a good question, to be honest. Um, and I'm not so sure yet, because <laughs> the thing is, I mean, what could be done and could be easily done, I think, is the transfer learning part. 
And uh, we already have also like uh, some results on the unsupervised learning part, which is more promising. So, um, because we realized on the unsupervised learning part, there was like classical supervised learning, but um, uh, with images, we realized that we get better results. Um, this would be something that we could publish, I think, um, but um, I'm not so sure, to be honest. So I'm not capable of telling you now if I will continue with this or just to try to go more into the nursing activity direction and see uh, what comes up there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so if you don't have, if you don't have more questions, I'll thank you again. Do a small clap <laughs> on behalf of everyone else. Uh, and I thank everyone for joining us as well. Uh, and hope that you are able to join us uh, in our next seminar. Um, we will send you an email and publish on Twitter and have uh, things available shortly after this one. Um, so thank you and have a nice day. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Aaron.